Hello everybody, welcome. Welcome to this iDesign Alumni webcast on actors, the past and future of software engineering. My name is Yuval Lowy. We do this webcast series for alumni of the iDesign masterclasses. And looking at the attendee list, I literally can put a picture in my head for most of you. For those of you who have guests and colleagues in the room, a few words about myself. I'm a software architect. Some say the software architect because I spent the last 20 years of my life focusing on architects, on the person behind the job, on the skills and techniques and ideas you need to succeed. I've personally mentored hundreds of architects all over the world in my master classes and in on-site engagements, published several books. I was part of the .NET, later on the WCF design effort, wrote more than 100 articles and system-wide papers, speak at conferences. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend, something they only gave to six people so far due to the impact they've had on the industry over the years. And if you need to contact me, it's idesign.net. And so, what are we in for here? One of the things we discuss in the Architects Masterclass is the cycle of software evolution. And we discuss that every new idea in software always comes in three phases. First comes the methodology, then comes the technology, and then comes the platform. Now, all three are always for the same thing. It's just different expression of the same thing. And so these cycles last roughly 14 years. In methodology phase, you typically try and do it on existing technology and existing platform, but it's a new methodology, so it's very ill-equipped. Then technology appears, allowing more to do it, because in the methodology phase, very few are capable of doing it. And then finally, a platform appears. If you lay it out on the timeline, here is what the big cycles in software have looked so far. In the late 60s, we started doing structured programming on assembly. Technology appeared in the 70s for doing C. In the late 70s, we had the object-oriented cycle. And then C++ appeared in the 80s, MFC as a platform in the 90s. But by then, we realized components are better than object. And we started doing components on MFC. COM appeared with ATL in 96, .NET as a platform in 2002. But well, then we realized components are nice, but services are much better. And so you could start doing the service-oriented methodology on .NET in 2002, but it was really rough. And then WCF appeared in 2007. And last year, the service fabric has appeared as a platform from doing services. Now, if you can clearly see, I've laid it out so it's visual that the methodology phase of the next epoch also always overlaps with the emergence of the platform for the previous epoch, the previous cycle. So today's overlapping is clearly the service fabric as a platform with actors as the new methodology. Now, each one of those cycles has a different driver. What made it uh, come into being? The driver this time is the demise of Moore's law coupled with the availability of mass computing. Let's drill into that. In the early 70s, a road appeared in front of software engineering. And just like the poem, we took one road and unfortunately, we've reached the end of that road. So let's discuss that road, the road taken. So in the early 70s, computers were very expensive to purchase. Literally, the price of the hardware was immense. And it was also very expensive to operate. They consumed a lot of power. There was the size of a big room. The software was horrendously expensive. There were large hardware monoliths, meaning we take for granted the fact that we can plug and play things into our computers today. For the longest time, that just wasn't the case. You want to change the hardware, we'll throw away the monolith and replace it with something else. And because of these cost constraints and very slow ability of changing, companies wanted to share the computer, the expensive computer, across as many users as they had. As a result, computers were not personal and were time-sharing limitation and so on. In fact, here's a very famous picture from those days. This is Richie of k &R fame in front of a PDP-11. You can clearly see the magnetic tapes on the top, the teleprinter in front, I mean, there's not even a monitor. That was a computer in the 70s. Horrendously expensive, require uh, the world's best experts to work on. Now, all that has changed with Intel in 1971. In 1971, Intel 
developed the first commercial microchip. It wasn't the first microchip that had to do with the Apollo mission to the moon, but it was the first commercial microchip. It was called the 4004. It was a four-bit computer, followed a year later with an 8-bit computer called the 8008, which was simply two 4004 concatenated together. But the real breakthrough was the 8080 in 1974. The 8080 wasn't just switching the digits of the 8004. The, 8, the 8080 was the world's first uh, PC. It powered the first PC. And at that point was commercial viability of producing mass numbers of computers. And at that point, Moore's law takes off. Now, Moore's law, strictly speaking, doesn't talk about performance. It simply talks about the number of transistors per chip. And Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel, and he observed in 1975 that the number of transistors in a chip doubles every two years. Now, the actual performance doubled every 18 months because the computers didn't have just more transistors. They actually had faster and smaller transistors. Let's make it more personal. Here's a picture of Gordon Moore with the other two founders of Intel, Brian Noyes and Andy Grove. And he's still alive. He's residing in San Francisco. And Moore's law has lifted the industry for 40 years. It was the best thing. It was the worst thing that has ever happened to the software industry. And it was the best thing because, as we know, it, it proliferated the computers. And on the other hand, they're saying that a rising tide lifts all ships, even the leaky ones. There was really no incentive of actually improving our act and cleaning up our systems and making a good design. Eh, short for mind, they're going to be just a new computer. It's going to be much better. And other industries, of course, didn't have Moore's Law. I mean, airplanes didn't get twice as fast every two years and so on. Now, here's an interesting chart that shows Moore's Law in action. In green, you see the number of transistors over the decades. And this is on the log scale. And we know that the straight line in the log scale means exponential behavior. And the green line is curving slightly up, which means this is actually slightly hyper-exponential behavior. This is very, very good Moore's Law in action. But in purple, we see the clock speed. And the clock speed has tracked up very nicely with the number of transistors up until the early OTs. And then, as you can clearly see, something is changing in the purple line. In fact, not only has it stalled, but recently it's even going down. And this obviously is a problem, right? We don't care about the number of transistors. We just care about the clock speed. We care how fast are the computers. And it's not simply true that computers are getting faster and faster as time goes by. At best, they're getting constant and even slower. Now, the demise of Moore's law is because of the commercial viability of silicon chips. Companies like Intel simply cannot make the silicon gate any smaller at any affordable price. Yes, you can do it in theory, but in practice, it just doesn't work. There's significant manufacturing issues because they use light to chisel up the gates, and it's below the wavelength of light. There's material purity with the acids involved. The quality control issues are immense. The, the gates are so small, there's now quantum effects between them. The R&D cost of doing this, the computers any faster are immense. And so we cannot make an affordable computer any faster. And while everybody's heard about Moore's law, something called Rock's law for semiconductor manufacturing, which is like the dark side of Moore's law, it simply states that the fabrication cost of the chip, or basically the plant required to make those chips, doubles every four years. So yeah, the computers are getting air twice as fast every two years, but it costs twice as much every four years to make them. And at some point, it becomes non-economically viable to make any faster computer. And if you think about it, it makes sense because... While Moore's law is exponential growth or even hyper-exponential, our world is actually finite. And in a finite world, all exponential growth has to come to an end at some point. I mean, if every grain of sand on the plant would have been an Intel CPU, even that would not be enough for the next doubling up of Moore's law. So it had to come to an end. Unfortunately for us, that point is in the past. We have noticed it about 2010, 2012, simply because companies like Intel had many projects in the pipeline. But by now, we know that computers are simply not getting any faster. And that, the demise of Moore's Law has stopped the virtuous cycle of hardware and software, hardware and software. We all know the jokes that Microsoft makes a new version of Windows that if you load it on your current PC, it makes it dog slow. And so you buy the next Intel uh, computer that can run the next version of Windows. But by then, Microsoft will make another version of Windows to make that piece of hardware dog slow. And so 
the zig and the zag, the yin and the yang, they kept feeding on each other. And for decades, that benefited both parties very well. But that has stopped because if the hardware is not getting any faster, why would anybody buy the new hardware? Why would anybody get a new software? Now, Microsoft responded to it by leaving the desktop market or even the server market for that matter and moving to the cloud as a brand new way of reinventing itself. And I understand why Microsoft is so obsessed with the cloud and Azure and such. Intel responded by simply doing more of the same. So now we have, we started by having four core CPUs and eight core CPUs. Intel is even working on an 80 core CPU. This is just more of the same. The problem with multiple core is that developers simply cannot take advantage of it. Multiple core is not the answer. Most developers have a hard time even with multiple threading on a single CPU. What are you going to do with multiple cores? And if anything, it makes the challenge even worse because hypercores increase the conflict, increase the chance for a conflict, which means you're going to have more synchronization issues. But the real issue is that simply sawing more CPUs and more threads on the software increases the misalignment with the real world and the business processes. Now, this is such an important point. We're going to have to devote several slides for it. In essence, it's the fact that the way we program is not aligned with the way the businesses we're trying to solve their business problems actually operate. Now, there's some latent consequences of the road we did take. Today, programs are arranged very sequentially. Now, that's actually a legacy of the old days where the program was literally loaded from punch cards or magnetic tapes. And so it was fairly sequential. And we had main and function and function. And that makes the program itself fairly sequential. And the consequence of sequential programming and the way that we're using very expensive pieces of hardware to run everything is that most of the computer is actually idle most of the time. If you're going to look in task manager, most of the time your computer is doing nothing. But you're paying for the computer 100% of the time. Same, by the way, goes with memory. The real bottleneck in most computers is the I.O. It's not the computational power. You're not even going to benefit from having faster and faster computer, even if Intel could make those, simply because most of the time the computer is doing nothing. And zero times anything is still zero. And even if you are trying to use that fast computer, it does require threads and locks. And the problem with threads and locks is that they do not actually scale. They do not scale in the software world, meaning as far as number of users and number of machines. They don't scale on the human scale as far as people that can actually write that kind of a code. The code in threading and locks is very, very complex, and it's actually out of reach for most developers. In fact, if you were to look at where we are today, no single computer can ever scale up with sufficiently large and complex business processes. If you try and help a computer, if you can't help with a computer to help the business, as beefy as that computer is, at some point the business gets more invoices, more people, more transaction, more traffic, and that simply doesn't work on one computer. And there's inherent mismatch between the parallel business processes, because in your business, people are working in parallel across teams and division and such, while we have a single computer trying to catch up in a Turing machine way, preemptively across everything. And that means the software you write cannot really mimic reality, because they're trying to funnel everything through this choke point called a single computer that does things sequentially, and trying to mimic that way a fundamentally parallel or massively parallel process called the business of the organization. And whenever the software can't mimic the organization or the business domain, bad things are sure to follow. In fact, what we see today is that because of the limitation of the software, the business conform to the software, which is completely distorted. The software should conform to the business, never the other way around. Now, of course, you could say, hold on a second. Nobody ever tries to do everything with a single computer that just doesn't scale. We know it. So we use distributed computing. And that is true, except distributed computing is really, really difficult. And our industry has a very poor track record of employing distributed computing. Developers are never taught how to do distributed computing right. They're taught sequential. Uh, they're never qualified. And in fact, if we look at our track record, it is very poor. And the number one reason is the human angle. Programmers are simply out of the depth when it comes to a serious distributed computing. And not just programmers, even experts are stumped by the complexity of distributed computing. But there's something else beyond the complexity. For more than 40 years, we've grown accustomed to sequential programming, meaning we write a program and a central processing unit is executing it. In fact, it has established itself as the only way to program. Z with a big capital letter. When people think about programming, they think sequential programming. And this is why what's going to come next, as far as the next epoch, will look initially totally alien. 
because it goes against how we have trained our brain to think about programming, but is in fact much simpler and superior in so many ways. You see, in the early 70s, I told you a, ro a road we took, but a fork appeared in the road, and there was another road. And there was another way of programming in the early 70s. You know, we say CPU, 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 but the C in CPU, which stands for central, was there for a reason. I mean, nowadays, nobody's ever seen anything beside the CPU, so why do we even say CPU? But in the early 70s, they had to put the C in there because there was another way of doing computers. Instead of a central processing unit, how about many, many, many simple and cheap processing units? And that is just another way of doing computers. In fact, Donald Knut in 1968 has captured the concept of mesh computing, and he described it as just another viable way of doing computers. Basically, you have a network of processing unit, not a single central processing unit. And this is before uh, Intel and Moore's law took off. It, maybe that would have been the way of the future. Now, if you're doing this kind of processing, it did require at the time in the 70s or late 60s dedicated hardware designed for the task. Here's a typical mesh or network of processing unit, and they're all wired up together to achieve some kind of uh, processing task. Now, this is a dedicated specific hardware setup using parallel computing. An absolute classic example of the advantage of doing this way is called sorting networks. Now, in a sorting network, you can sort n numbers in one tick. I know it goes against what you've all been taught is possible, but let me show you an example. You can very easily build a simple computer, a comparator, that takes two numbers, A and B, and in one tick, sorts them up and puts the lower value at the top and the higher value at the bottom. And so, for example, if I'm giving it four and three, after one tick, it will sort it up into three and four. Now, this is a simple building block. You can actually use copies of it to build much more sophisticated network. For example, here's using five of these comparators to sort, to sort four numbers in three steps. And the way this kind of sorting network actually works is if you look at the color coding, after the first tick, comparator three is fed the lowest of the two values, and comparator four is fed the higher of the two values. And as a result, after the second tick, comparator three can output the lowest of the four, and comparator four can output the higher of the four. All we have to do now is sort the middle two numbers, and as a result, after the third tick, we have the four numbers actually sorted out. Here is a more uh, numerical view of it. If you watch the numbers four, three, two, and one progress through the sorting network, you can see it's coming up as one, two, three, and four on the other side. Now, with sequential programming, we know we can only sort n numbers in n log n. That would be kind of like the best case scenario. I mean, most people will do just n square. And so I just showed you you can actually sort even in sublinear or even sublogarithmic uh, level. But the real problem with n log n in sequential programming is what if you have an ongoing feed of data? Well, you have to basically chop it into sequences of n so you can fit it into your sorting algorithm and buffer the rest while you're actually sorting the first n. And so you've got buffering, you've got delays, and you can only do it in chunks and so on. Now, in sorting network, you can actually sort in order of one for continuous feed of values. After you're filling the pipes, every tick, you get a new batch of sorted numbers. In fact, it's very easy to show that you can use a sorting network of n to build larger networks, including double the size. For example, how about I view the previous network we just described on the right as a single comparator that can sort four numbers, and then I can use that to sort eight numbers. And you can pause this recording later and look at the color coding. It pretty easily shows how you can sort eight numbers, and much the same way you can sort 16 and 32 and so on. And in fact, there's ways of optimizing it. There's something called Banish networks. Banish was a Czech uh, computer scientist in the 50s, he came up with a sorting network uh, that can do roughly in a logarithmic uh, uh, computing uh, power. And nobody has ever been able to actually improve on a banished network. And you can build recursively this kind of uh, network for larger sets. For example, here's an optimized banished network that sorts eight values in five steps. Now, this is like the Parallel Programming 101, this is like the most simple example. There's many, many other ways of building fairly sophisticated networks that sort 
or do very sophisticated algorithm, doesn't have to be with sorting, any kind of data uh, uh, computational. Typically, they involve multi-dimensional or three-dimensional layout of processing units arranged in hypercubes, and they can be generic meshes, or can be domain-specific topology for a particular business. And you can have these networks be fixed, or they can change with the business, meaning each business will have its own version. You can even change these networks at runtime based on the values flowing through the network. So if most of the values are already sorted, you will pivot to something else and so on. Now, this kind of a solution scales much better. And the reason is, as the traffic, the transaction, the customers grow, you can very easily add more of this processing unit. You don't have to actually dive into very difficult distributed computing. The other thing is that your hardware is now being utilized 100% of the time or near 100% of the time. Now, if this is such a good idea, why we've never seen it? We've never seen it because massively parallel hardware never came. Intel was just too successful with doing the 8080 and its uh, successors, and Muslim was just too compelling. If there's something that offers you, you know, you have to actually clean up your act, but next year you're going to be twice as fast without doing anything, and two, four years from now you're going to be four times as fast without cleaning your act. This is too compelling for people to actually invest in anything besides that. So the hardware never came. Now, today, we've reached the end of the road we did take. We cannot make the computers any faster. Distributed computing is a dead end. But what we can do today is we can use software to emulate the hardware we never got in the 70s. I mean, the one thing we do not miss today is horsepower. So why not just use horsepower to emulate this kind of hardware? In fact, cloud computing today provides unparalleled processing power, pun intended. So we can use this unparalleled processing power to emulate parallel processing. And the act of modeling software is just one of these possible options of doing this kind of emulation of the hardware and the parallel programming. In fact, the actor model is not new. The actor model was first put forward by Hewitt in 1973. 1973 is a year before the 8080. Again, it's a year before Moore's Law, it's a year before we decisively take the other road. And it turns out that today, the actor model is the only way to build what I call the greater IoT. I know you've all heard about the IoT, but that is too small. Think about greater IoT. Think about trillions of connected devices. How are you going to do that using distributed computing? It's just not going to work. But the actor model can enable, enable us to tackle the scale and concurrency of the greater IoT. And there's two problems we're going to have to face. One of them is going to be the volume, just the sheer number of devices that we're going to have to keep track of would bring any CPU to its knees. But the other problem is the rate of data change. Imagine two new devices kicking data at you. With sequential programming, you're going to have to buffer it and chop it and try and come to terms with it. It's going to be horrendously difficult and complex. And in fact, the IoT, the, the market driver for the IoT is our ability at runtime to process massive set of dynamic data. In fact, if all the data of the IoT is stale because you're buffering and such, there's no point in doing the IoT. So I would argue if you want to do the IoT, the only way to do it would be using massively parallel processing of the actor model. And the real gem in the actor model, it allows us to do correct modeling of real-world business processes as opposed to what we've been doing so far. The actor model is inspired by physics. If you look in physics, each particle in physics, be uh, a proton, an atom, is actually standalone. And it doesn't require anything from anybody else. It may interact with other particles that may be put in a grid or a crystal or a mesh. But the critical observation here is that particles in nature are simple, but yet we use simple particles to build incredibly complex bodies. And that makes much more complex, uh, much more common design sense. For example, human and chickens use identical particles. Uh, our electrons and protons are not smarter than chickens. So the difference between us and chickens is that we are put together using same building blocks, but in smarter ways. Another design analogy is your body. Your body is not just one giant tissue, one giant CPU doing everything. You have distribution of responsibility into organs and even individual cells, all working in parallel. Now, in the actor model, each actor emulates a simple processing unit. Emphasis here is on simple. Now, instead of dedicated hardware wiring that requires literally uh, uh, dedicated hardware and wires, we can use messages and addresses to emulate this kind of hardware. All actors would execute concurrently to all other actors. 
Actors can manage internal state, but ideally it's going to be very limited for a short period of time, very simple state if you want to do it. Now, actors can never directly change another actor state, just like a particle in nature can never change another particle state. And because actors can never change another actor state, there's no need to synchronize. And yet you benefit from concurrent parallel execution because if all actors execute in parallel to all other actors, you get parallel execution. On the other hand, no need to synchronize because they don't interfere with each other. And so no need to devolve into sequential computation. Actors are often arranged into hierarchy of networks. And typically all actors at the same level are going to be identical. But you can have different levels in the hierarchy which are very different. Now, probably the single most important design guidelines you will ever hear about actors is right here on the slides when it says strive for dumb actors and smart networks. Say to yourself every single time because you're going to have legacy of decades of trying to beef up the actors and make them smart. No, what you want is dumb actors and smart networks. Each actors perform very simple repetitive tasks and all the smartness goes into the network. For example, let's look at two trivial examples. A movie set. In a movie set, we have actors performing. The script can be incredibly complex and the plot can twist, but every director will tell you what you really want is dumb actors. The last thing a director wants is smart actors that have things like opinions and the light should be like this and do a close-up on me like that, right? Look at the factory floor where every factory worker doesn't have a mechanical engineering degree, but they do repetitive, simple tasks again and again and again. But they are put together in a very complex way that does a very complex things like a car or an airplane or a laptop. In fact, the actual program in this world is going to be the layout of the network, not the code in any single actor. We're going to visit this again. And that follows, therefore, that to change the program, you have to change the network. You hardly ever change the individual actors involved in the mesh. For example, let's look at a typical organization or a company. Companies cannot rely on superheroes. Even if you're able to hire the entire Avenger team and they're absolutely superheroes, there's only 2,000 hours a year you can employ them. And that means there's a natural cap on how big the company can get, how much business it can tackle, how much revenue it can make, and so on. And besides, we cannot hire the Avengers. So what do companies do? Companies never resort to superheroes. Instead, they use regular people, but they use lots and lots of regular people. In such analogy, each employee is an actor, and the actors in the company are arranged in some kind of a hierarchy. Now, the lowest level workers perform repetitive, simple tasks, and then we arrange them into hierarchy of network of actors. We can have an individual. In fact, each individual can be a network of one, but individuals are typically arranged in teams. And teams are arranged into divisions, and divisions are arranged into companies or groups, and so on. Now, to change how the company operates, you perform a reorg. Now, reorg is simply the company reprogramming itself. It changes the report structure, it changes how the messages flow through the system, it changes its internal wiring. But the actual act of works hardly ever changes. Now, we all used to sneer and saying, oh, it's another reorg of the month, another reorg, and nothing ever happens at us at our level, and we scorn at it, but that's actually no reason for scorning. A really, really good reorg is when nothing changes in your own world, meaning the act of work never changes, but the overall flow of information, the way the company programs itself, that changes. And so it's a good indicator that the act of work hardly ever changes. Now, we can actually have a hierarchy of networking and even managers. Now, managers in such a company are also actors, and they typically manage lower level actors and they can report to other network of managers and so on. Information flows to the company in the form of messages. Could be email or mail or voicemail or, or CRM or even paper letters. It doesn't really matter, but we send messages in such a world. And ideally in a company, no actor should, any, should ever block any other actor. Another example in the hardware world. Let's look at the LED a LED matrix. Imagine a LED matrix that needs to display a kind of a message. We can literally treat each LED as a simple actor that can do the simplest of all tasks, turn an LED on or off. Now, each LED performs the simple task, but we can arrange those into a simpler network of characters. So we can come kind of a grid of these LEDs. And if you want to display a letter, we're going to have to come up with some kind of a set of instructions on and off for the letters to display the character. So let's call that the character network. Now, each character network can be managed by a character.
character actor, and the character actor knows how to convert an ASCII information to a series of on-off messages to its comprising subordinate LED actors. Now, we can take individual actor networks uh, of characters and arrange them in a simple sequence to form a row network, and the row network would simply display a row of text. Now, each row can be an actor that knows how to convert a string into chop it into individual characters. And why stop there? We can arrange row actors in a simple sequence to form a page. And we can have a page actor managing a page. And we can then chop it up into a book and so on. So graphically, it looks something like this. At the very bottom, we have a network of one. It's an LED actor, can only do on and off. We can arrange that into a fairly complex grid of a character. We can arrange characters into rows and so on. And so it may look something like this. Here's displaying the uh, obligatory hello world in actors. In fact, I had to take several screenshots in rapid succession to actually see th things happening here because it's all in parallel, as you can see. And we're going to make this particular demo available on the iDesign website. And we have it running both on the service fabric and in service model EX dot service fabric, our emulation of the service fabric. It's completely indistinguishable. It uses exactly the same code base as everything else in service model EX dot service fabric. Let's look at the car assembly line. Now, in a car assembly line, each worker is an actor performing a very simple repetitive tack. Pick a, pick a piece, drill it, switch it, move it. Drill it, switch it. You never do anything else. Now, each stop in an assembly line is concurrent to all other stops. We don't build the car sequentially like we execute the program. All the stops in the assembly line execute concurrently to all the other stops. Now, while each individual stop in the assembly line is dead simple, to the point that even somebody who barely finished high school can execute, it doesn't mean the assembly line is simple. All the smart is in the design of the assembly line, and in the aggregate, it can actually be fairly complex. Now, the partly built car and the parts arrive and leave each stop, and this is an analogy to the actor state and IO messages arriving to each uh, individual actor. Now, a key observation is that it's the progression of the car through the line that is the assembly of the car. The car is not assembled in any particular place in the factory. It's the progression which is actually the assembly. And exactly the same is true as an actor-based system. It's the progression of the message through the network that is the execution of the program. Now, this is a good example because what we see is simple steps comprising a complex objective. And try and emulate a, a car assembly line using a traditional programming model. It becomes very, very difficult to do it with a single program on a single CPU, trying to emulate and simulate. And you're going to have to do time sharing and chopping and preemptive and such. It's never going to be right. And now, what happens if you want to change the factory? This is a massive, massive change to your program. But if you're doing it, the way it's done today in the factory itself. You can actually change the factory and move things up and down the assembly line, but individual actors are never disturbed. So now if I'm trying to come up with a simulation of the entire just-in-time uh, supply chain of the factory, and I'm going to emulate 20 million steps in the supply chain of the factory of all the parts and all the trucks and all the dealers, all the parts and everything else, I can keep doing it this way. And at some point, I will fail doing it with sequential programming, but with Actor, I just keep going. And why stop there? Let's also do financial modeling of all the customers in the world and all the financial needs and how that impacts the supply chain and the orders of the factory and on and on and on. Let's look at another example, a bank. If you're trying to do an Actor version of a bank, it's simplicity itself. Each account is a simple Actor. We don't need the databases. Each Actor is very trivial state, which is the balance of the uh, account. In fact, in a bank which uses this model, everything is an actor. Customers are an actor or are actors interacting with the bank. In fact, a single customer can have many accounts, just like a character can have many LEDs. Tellers are actors. In fact, other banks you interact with can actually be actors too. And of course, those actors manage their internal accounts and so on. Each account actor is a state. It's the account balance. It also is some message queue that impacts the internal state. Now, suppose the balance in the bank in a particular account is $25, and three messages arrive concurrently. Deposit 20, withdraw 30, and withdraw 40. Now, suppose we have some kind of uh, FIFO queue, but it can be priority-based, meaning a teller is more important than a customer, and so on. Now, we know 
the, the several options at that point. If I do the deposit first, then I can do one withdrawal, but not the other. But if I do the withdrawals first, both withdrawals can also fail. And so while I'm doing that, you can actually respond with errors or with success. In fact, at the end of these three messages, you're going to have three possible states for the actor. It can be 5 or 15 or 45. In fact, it's an indeterminate result. We don't know which balance we're going to end up with. And in sequential programming world, this sounds like a very scary statement. But let's look at sequential programming trying to do this bank. We're going to use some kind of a database, and we're going to have to load the data from a database to some kind of uh, ORM layer that does some kind of queries, and we're going to have to lock accounts, and we're going to sterilize the users against the bank because we have transaction or we have locking. And we have to manage the account state. We're going to have account objects, and we're going to have to do it uh, per call and get state and do work and save state. We can do all of these things, and we have been doing it for decades, except this is an incredibly complex programming model. You have to, of course, distribute it for scale. And it's unnatural. Most developers are taught to program a very simple programming model that has a simple object that has state. Well, what I showed you in, in the previous slide is a very simple state that most developers should be able to feel very natural with. But the real kicker of it all is indeterminate results. Life itself is indeterminate. We don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow and what lane we're going to take on the way to work and what's going to be our balance in the bank account tomorrow morning. It's indeterminate. And so actors are a better uh, model of reality because if life itself is indeterminate, then deterministic modeling doesn't really is not capable of properly modeling reality. And there's something else going on. If you have enough of these actors, you start having emergent behaviors. And life is an emergent behavior. You do not behave like the sum of uh, 10 trillion cells that you have in your body. You behave like a completely different entity. And your company doesn't behave like a hundred individual. It behaves like a completely different entity because you put the actors together. And so we can actually have a much more good approximation of reality if we allow this emergent behavior to surface. Another example that will make the actor model shine uh, is the smart grid of the future. It turns out that the current power grid is very centralized and it's very fragile. We produce energy in one place, we ship it to where it's consumed. We cannot integrate renewable resources. We cannot integrate solar or wind. I know we try it, but we cannot do it on scale. And the reason is the grid has to be perfectly in balance. And there's no storage capacity. And if we have enough solar or wind, we're actually going to destabilize the grid and cause a permanent blackout. We have massive losses due to producing the power in one place and transmitting it and transforming it all the way to the home and the buildings. We cannot use electric vehicles. Electric vehicles actually imply tripling the power requirements of the grid, and the grid can barely keep up with what it needs to do today, so it can't actually be tripled up. The grid is very expensive to operate. The difference between peak and base load makes uh, required for capacity, makes it unreliable, makes it very expensive. Now, all of this we could have actually survived with if energy was cheap, but energy is not cheap. Energy is getting horrendously expensive. And so we're going to have to transition to local production and management of power as opposed to a distributed model. Now, in such a world, every electricity producer is going to be an actor. The power station can be an actor, but your backup generator can be an actor. An individual solar panel can be an actor. A wind turbine can be an actor. Now, we're also going to have to integrate storage devices. So a battery can be an actor, but some kind of kinetic flywheel storage. Your electric vehicle can store energy. You can pump water up a dam. You can use compressed air. Each power consumer is going to be an actor down to the individual AC, down to the individual light bulb, a vehicle, and even a building as a whole. Now, we can have power brokers as actors. It could be the utilities, it could be local agents acting on your behalf, brokering power for you. We can even have marketplace where the actors actually play. Now, we can start building hierarchies where each solar panel is arranged to an array of solar panel, basically a network of solar panels with an array actor, of course, and each battery cell, which has to be managed individually, has to be balanced individually, watered individually, but we can still arrange them into battery banks with a battery bank actor. And each wind turbine is an actor arranged to wind farm with a farm actor that can predict the weather and bid on doing uh, uh, power production. Each individual AC unit, each light bulb can be arranged into a building network with a building actor that manages the power consumption and needs of the building. And 
as we start arranging these power consumers and power actors and power storage into microgrids, we're going to have a microgrid actor that manages the production and the consumption and the storage inside that grid. Now, microgrid actors can transact with utility actor or even with other microgrid actors. And each microgrid can be standalone, meaning even if there's a blackout in your city, your little neighborhood can still have the lights on because you manage your grid properly. And you can produce and manage energy locally, and you can avoid the waste of transmission and distance and transformations. And you can incorporate local generation, and you can be very resilient. The name of the game here is resiliency. The current grid will let us down. Now, each actor in such a world, down to the light bulb or the building or the town, can decide if it wants to consume power or sell power, meaning if the power is good enough, I'd rather sell it, or you can store it and sell it when the price is actually better. And you can hedge, you know what, I'm not quite sure about tomorrow, but I'll buy some of it now just to be sure. And you can engage that for in futures, you can predict your own needs, you can publish your future needs, ask for bids from other actors to do it, and have this whole transactive energy acting in the marketplace with emergent behavior we can barely imagine now. Another market driver for the actor model is that our business software just got too complex. If you look at the typical business software from ERPs to accounting or any kind of business software, it's mostly an unmanageable monolith where we try to put more car web, more duct tape, make it bigger and bigger and bigger, try to catch up. But you know what? It didn't work. There's a natural cap and no single system can ever catch up with the complexity of the business. It was ordained to be so. And besides having an unmanageable monolith, we hit a resource crisis. We're simply unable to hire enough competent, qualified developers and architects and testers to maintain this monolith. We've reached the end of the road. And the other problem is that even if it was maintainable, there was no good affinity with the real world. But the actor model can give us a high affinity of the real world. It's also a lot easier to do than sequential programming on a CPU. Another market driver is what I already mentioned, the greater IoT. And by greater IoT, I'm talking an unmanageable number of connected devices. In fact, to the right, we see my hand and it's holding a little computer. What looks like a chip is actually a full-blown $7 computer that has Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, running Windows 10, .NET Core, and everything you want in a tiny, tiny little $7 computer. And to make it even more interesting, this one is arranged to work in a mesh out of the gate at the hardware level. And if you think this is small and amazing, look at the image on the left. The image on the left, that tiny dot, is actually a computer. And in a microscope, you can compare it to a human hair. And so this is called smart dust. And smart dust would make the $7 computer look like a monolith. In fact, we're going to spray these things from airplanes. In fact, as early as 2009, I predicted this kind of a thing. And I started saying everything should be an actor. Now, as I envisioned this IoT, unfortunately, I didn't call it the IoT because it was so ahead of the curve, it wasn't even called the IoT yet. I called it the energy net. But if you Google my name next to the word energy net and replace the word energy net with the word IoT, you get what we now call the IoT or I'm calling the greater IoT. Now, we haven't really defined what actually actors really are. So actors are services, but they're very simple services. Now, the reason we like to use services is because services already use messages, not a thread called stack. And so they already act when they receive a message. In addition, services are addressable. And this is a secret sauce. Having a message and having it sent to an addressable service is how we're going to emulate that missing hardware. In fact, as you start building actor systems, like, say, the LED metrics I showed you before, it gets trivial to build this grid simply having um, addressing schema and addressing convention, page, dot, line, dot, character, dot, LED. It becomes very, very natural to build it this way. And you can think about the unholy mess of doing it with a single software program in a CPU. Another thing to note with actors, that actors only make sense at mass. There is no utilization for an actor. Never fall for it. There is no an actor. Actors only make sense in mass, and the bigger, the better. Now, actors are actually small. Networks are large. Don't try and improve your program and making the actor smarter and another if and else and more state. No, 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 no. You're doing something wrong. Change the network. 
In fact, octals are always arranged in a network or a mesh. That's the only way to make their value come to the surface. Now, in a hierarchy of network, meaning we have different uh, network grids of actors, actors can process messages or actor messages and can receive messages from peer actors or high-level actors that manages them and queries their state. Or they can post messages to other actors. Now, typically, they would post them to lower-level actor network manage uh, that they manage, but it can be peer network, just like in a sorting network, can actually be one actor talking to another actor. Now, if you have a complex hierarchy, sometimes you will feel tempted to flatten it, and then you're going to run into issues that some border actors are going to do both the work of the actor plus deal with the I.O. with the outside world. And that may actually optimize the performance of the network, but it's going to make the network so much harder to understand. This is very simple to what we discuss in the architects masterclass of opening up a closed architecture. Closed architecture maximizes encapsulation, maximizes structure. And if you open it up, you start optimizing the uh, performance and the flow, but it makes the network very difficult to understand. And so it's a, a very simple analogy of opening up a closed architecture. Now, when it comes to addresses of actors, addresses can be unique, but actors can share an address. Now, a single actor can monitor multiple addresses. So there's really some kind of an end-to-end relationship between actors and addresses. And literally any mapping goes, and that's where the creativity is, and that's where you have to add the value by designing the network, not the actors. In fact, as far as design, design you never need to know the identity of the actors behind the address. Just like if you're sending something uh, for a company like a service request or a part to be fixed, you don't care which employee in the company service your request. You send it to the company address. Now, actors can act as proxies for other actors, and the number one reason you want to do it is for security reasons. And an advanced scenario is that you have messages containing the address of other actors you're going to propagate the message to. And when you start doing that, you have dynamic networks that basically build themselves and wire themselves on the fly, both on the business problem you're trying to solve and on the context of the state of the program and specific values. Now, since multiple actors may monitor the same address, you can use that for broadcasting messages. In fact, a classic use for it is having two or more subsystems that both of them need to respond to a message that gets to the software. And so, for example, if a service request goes to uh, a company, both uh, the accounting company needs, the accounting department needs to respond to it, and the technical service department, maybe some CRM needs to know about it. Now, typically, you would use a message bus to broadcast the messages to multiple actors. Now, nothing stops you from having a hierarchy of subsystems and a hierarchy of buses. So, an abstract architecture would look something like this. We can have some kind of a root message bus that pushes messages to some actors in parallel, and those actors push to lower-level message buses that have other actors hanging on it, and then we have subsequent uh, lower-level message buses. And it, if you think about it, this is actually a fractal. And taken to the ultimate uh, conclusion, you will start building fractal of software that have uh, uh, fabrics of fabrics in them and so on. And by the way, this particular design diagram is from a system I designed uh, for a customer last year. So this is already put into production. Another interesting uh, pattern you start adopting is what we call it, I designed the messages, the application. And we've seen it many years, uh, for many years in the systems we designed with our customers in exercises we've done with our alumni. And in essence, what we try and do is exactly the idea of the factory assembly line. It's the trying to do, achieve the business workflow as a progression between subsystem. In essence, what we do is a string, stringing together discrete use cases that the execution of the program is the progression of the message through these stops. There's no single actor can say, aha, that's where the program is. No, it's the progression through this that actually does it. So we call it the message is the application. Another thing to note is that since you like to respond to messages and they do it uh, typically asynchronously with their callers, there's no way of getting any kind of uh, results or error information. Now, we can absolutely compensate for that by having a response actor. So if your actor needs to respond with results or needs to send errors, you can actually have a dedicated response actor. Now, it could be that there's no response and no error. You just move it to the next uh, uh, subsystem, and that's fine too. 
And you can even separate. You can have one actor for the response and the values, another actor for handling the faults. So the abstract pattern would look something like this. A client posts messages to a queue in front of the actor or a buffer. The actor processes it and then responds back to a client-provided response queue with a response actor. And if this looks familiar, it should, because this is exactly the same pattern we show in the Architects Masterclass for queued services. Now, as far as handling the error, you can take it a step level and have dedicated watchdog actor that manage other actors and start dealing with their issues. And since the watchdog itself could fail, you can have watchdog of watchdogs. And basically, you start mimicking your own company or organization structure. And you would try and mimic literally the way conflict are resolved over there. So if one team can't solve something, they escalate to their manager. If that manager can't do it, they escalate to their manager. But there's always some kind of a root authority, the boss, that says, you do this, you do that. So you're going to have to mimic that kind of authority too. Now, it's important to know that as you design actors, the lower the actor, the more primitive it is from the business perspective. It may do something very complex, but from the business perspective, it's less and less relevant. For example, uh, we can have quarks that assemble neutrons, that assemble atoms, that build into molecules and cells and organs and bodies. Now, the quark itself is super complex. It's got lots of quantum physics equations, statistics, and probability, and, and not deterministic things. But there's no business value in the quark or the neutron. And you may be able to see business value when we talk about bodies, but probably not even that. Another thing to note about actors is that they shun with processing pipeline. If you only have one thing to do, one off, sequential programming is going to be probably better. But if you have an ongoing, never-ending processing of data, and you do it in a pipeline, you do this, and then you do that, and then you do this, and constantly things are fed into a pipeline and results coming out typically to another mesh of actors that keep chewing on it, the actor is a good model and sequential programming is going to be pure hell. Now, what you want to do when you design the actors, you want to have modular actors. Modular actors means you simply have to have, you want to do more work, you just add more of the same. You don't change the actor. For example, think of the sorting network. It's still the same binary comparator, but we add more and more of it in order to sort larger and larger sets. And this makes common design sense. For example, a larger house is made of more bricks, not larger bricks, right? And so we build a bigger house by having more and more of the same size bricks that do the same work. And this is a good design line. You always use building blocks of high abstraction, but you never change the building blocks. And again, th th these points are so important, I have a dedicated slide on it. You always strive for dumb actors and smart networks. And the dumber actor, the better, and the smarter network, the better. In order to change the program, you change the network. You don't touch the individual actors. This is not sequential programming. A word or two about reliability. When you are wiring up things this way, the network really needs to be reliable. Now, that's not the same as guaranteed delivery. Messages may not necessarily be delivered. But the point on reliability is guaranteeing knowledge. There's always a known outcome. Either the message get there and you know about it, or it didn't get there and you also know about it. And you also want to strive for message delivery at most once. No retries. Retries would completely trash your mesh. Now, since delivery may take a long time, uh, we don't know exactly when the actor can process the message. They can do it immediately. They can do it later. And in the Architects Masterclass, I even describe a concept of a synchronization tick. And it's an advanced concept how you actually do this kind of a thing. It's all possible. But the important thing, the guideline is, do not design to depend on responsiveness. As far as message processing, don't do long-running processes in the actor. Now, given the fact that actors should be simple and trivial, the mere fact you resort to long-running processes means something is wrong, right? You want to process as soon as they arrive and move on. Now, actors could post messages to themselves. That's how you do recursion in the actor model. But the important thing is, even if you do that, you only process one message at a time. If you do multiple messages at a time, you will have to synchronize, and that will kind of torpedo the whole idea here. And it's also important not to archive messages inside the actors. Actors should be simple. An actor with an archive, it's not simple anymore. You have to manage the buffer and deal with what happens if it's overflowing and what do you decide to archive and put a lot of logic into that. And that's sequential programming all over again. Now, if you want to do archiving, you don't do it inside the actor. When you adopt the actor model, everything is an actor, right? Everything is an actor. So how about having an actor 
for an ac archive. An ac archive actor or a logbook actor, that's much better congruent with the overall model. You can also have two types of network uh, and basically design two distinct types of actor, uh, uh, actor's network. One network is for managing state. And think again back at the bank where we have a trivial set of actors managing a very large bank. And in such a world, the actors do have state. And in order for you to actually figure out what you actually are going on here, you queries are basically going to be a visitor pattern you run against that graph of actors. And you can even have concurrent visitors. There's no need to lock anything. And these visitors can run concurrently. Now, you may get some non-determinant results, but that's OK. The other type of networks are computational meshes. And the classic example is the other example I gave you, which is sorting network. Now, in the sorting network, there's really no state inside the actor. There is only the transient state as you compare two values and you move on. You never even save those values, just output them, and you don't really care. And note that actor design patterns are always organization pattern, right? All the design patterns are in the organization of the actors, not in what happens inside the individual actor. Let me end this by discussing some common misconception. As early as this model is, there's already misconceptions, right? That's the nature of our industry. And the number one misconception is actors don't require synchronization. You can have your cake and eat it too. You can do parallel programming and no need to synchronize. And the sad reality is that is not true. And the reason is when you set up the network, that is almost always requiring synchronization. And the reason is if the mesh gets considerably large, and again, the larger the mesh, the more value you can add as far as the actors. Well, if you have a very large mesh to build, you're not going to build that mesh sequentially. You're going to build that mesh concurrently just because of the sheer number of actors you have to deal with. And if you're building that kind of a mesh concurrently, you're going to have to synchronize the setting up of the network. In addition, the IO to and from the network has to be synchronized. It has to go somewhere, and somebody has to read it. And so you're going to need some kind of boundary or managing actors that deal with the IO between your mesh and the outside world, which may not be even actor-based. That needs to be synchronized. Any kind of handling errors requires synchronization because now you need to synchronize handling of the error with the regular flow of things through the mesh. For example, even an assembly line that is highly actor-based and every stop in the line is a separate actor and it's all parallel and concurrent, it's all good. But what happens if there's a defect in one of the cars? Well, you know what? You have to stop the line and now you have to basically synchronize the defect and the root cause and flush stops from the line and you have to deal with synchronization. So when error happens, you have to deal with synchronization. The only thing which doesn't require synchronization is the individual worker actor. That indeed does not require synchronization, but everything else requires synchronization. Actors improve throughput and performance. Well, it is true that actors excel performing parallel work and they have incredible throughput that have basically these sub-logarithmic uh, processing overhead and maybe order of one, even for insane data set. That is all true. But something else will happen. What would most likely happen is you start employing actors in mass. It will convert your computational bound problem into an IO bound problem. It would be a question of how fast can you feed things from your network, from your GUI, from your databases into the meshes. And as a result, stipple, throughput will still lag. That will not go away. There's always some kind of a natural bottleneck. Actors are simple. Well, good actors are indeed simple. The challenge is going to be the network. The network can be very, very complex. In fact, what I find is that actors shift the burden from coding to designing. You spend almost no time designing because the code inside each individual actor is trivial. You spend all your juices in deep cycles reflecting on the network and trying different modeling and simulating them and testing this versus that in order to figure out what is going to be the right design of the network. And that's going to increase, by the way, the disconnect between today's reality, people as chow any kind of effort in design and just code ahead like crazy, and the complexity of the task they're going to have to solve. It's really, really top heavy in design and very light in programming. In fact, I'll tell you something else. If you cannot easily approximate the business domain, you are either missing something or the actor is simply ill-suited, meaning 
it's not highly pipeline in nature. There's no ongoing workflow. You don't benefit from actors. Don't yield to complexity. Don't end up with an actor model, which is actually very complex. That's not good. Actors are services or even objects. Well, not really. And it sounds strange because a few slides ago, I said that actors are services, but they're not really services. What does it mean? If you look, say, at the jumbo jet, the fuel pump provides a very valuable service to the jumbo jet. It pumps fuel. The jumbo jet will die without the pump, without the pump and that's a service. But let's look at the rivet on the wing of the jumbo jet. The thousand of rivets. Well, I guess the rivet is a service. I guess it uh, provides a valuable service. It fastens this part of the wing to the beam underneath. So you could say the rivet is a service. But that would not be a natural interpretation of what the rivet is, right? And so that's kind of like what actors are. Actors are like the rivets. They're not like the fuel pumps, okay? Actors should be very, very simple. The complexity, again, is in the network. Now let's talk about technology. We know that the new methodology always appears at the previous epoch platform phase. And actors are perfectly on script pun intended, because they appeared exactly when the service fabric appeared as a platform for services. But the platform of today are very poor fit for doing actors. It's designed for doing services. It's not designed for doing actors. In fact, writing actors on the service fabric today is exactly like doing object in C in 1978, or doing components in MFC in 1992, or writing services in .NET in 2002. I mean, Every one of these things was abused in that respect. C was so amazing, you can even start talking about object orientation. I mean, you couldn't do object orientation in assembly. MFC was so amazing, you can even do components. But it was really hard to do it in C++ and MFC. .NET, when it came out, was so amazing, you even start doing services. But it was really designed for components. And the same is true with doing actors on the service fabric. Service Fabric is really designed for services. Uh, let me point out that even though Microsoft is pushing doing actors on the Service Fabric, it is called the Service Fabric, after all, not the actor fabric. There's consequences. Today, doing actors is going to be difficult. It's going to be just like doing C object orientation in C or doing services in .NET 2002. Does it mean it's not going to get done? No. Few are going to endeavor to do it, but it's going to be out of reach for most. And the problem is, whatever code you write this way will be obsolete later when the technology does emerge. In fact, there's already several good actor languages. There's Erlang, there's Salsa, there's about a dozen of these languages. There's even a few actor stacks. There's something called Akka, there's Akka for Java, there's Akka for .NET. Microsoft tried to do something called uh, Orleans. These things did happen. But the reality is that you cannot use regular service stack for actors. They were never designed for the scale of actors. And that has consequences. For example, if you're trying to do actors today on things like the service fabric or even uh, ACA, you have base class for message processing and you have explicit message wrangling. You literally have to write messages and pop them and push them and pass them. You have to register host and uh, you have to do contract uh, uh, for basically service contract and some message-based contracting. And the kicker is you have to set up the mesh completely by hand. You are the one doing the wiring A to Z. And this just puts it out of reach for most. It doesn't feel right. Just like doing service rotation on .NET 15 years ago didn't probably feel right. Now, if we look at the historical mandate of methodology technology platform and the timeline, very consistently, some four years into the methodology phase, some kind of a technological stack emerges. And so if we extrapolate this, we can predict that we're going to get some service-oriented, some actor-oriented language or some actor-oriented tools by around 2020. What do we expect to see there? We expect to see some dedicated syntax, maybe dedicated syntax for doing actors or handling their uh, messages. I mean, you see mesh factories. Give me a banish uh, grid of so-and-so dimension, right? Give me a hypercode for doing that. And the factory, if you give it a delegate that contains the code inside the actor, should be able to spin all of these things for you. Nobody should do this kind of a thing by hand. So where are we today? This is a massive departure from the past. And so unless you enjoy being a deer in the headlight, 
you have to begin preparing today, which is why we're doing this webcast for the iDesign alumni. The best way to prepare is having proper system architecture and decomposition. Nothing does that like the iDesign method. And the method already will identify for you the managers and the engines, which are the building blocks that you are later can actually break down into actors. In fact, if you look at what we have been espousing with the method, we're talking about a very granular use of services. We're not talking about big microservices. We're talking about smaller, smaller, smaller services. And the method calls, as you know, for liberal use of queues and using the messages, the application. In fact, these are probably what you should be doing. Start using the Adizan method, have a very granular use of services. The granular, the better. Use queues everywhere. Adopt the messages, the application. Try and break down your program into progression through a pipeline and avoid sequential programming. Now, that still won't make the programming task easier. And so we are working on a new framework called Service Fabric EX that would do mesh factories and uh, actor layout automatically for you and stay tuned for that one. And so for conclusion, actors are an alternative way of programming. Not new, it's been around for many decades. And while it looks initially totally alien, it is in fact so much simpler once you start doing things way, you'll shake your head and say, how could I have ever done anything else? Now, contrast that kind of uh, emergence of a new idea with prior alien, in quote, ideas. When I said 15 years ago, every class is a service, every class should be a service, then I got a lot of uh, shaking heads and disbelief and serious backlash from the industry and flack from bloggers. But 15 years later, it's the much natural thing to do. In fact, it is exactly every class as a service all over again, with the shaking of the heads, with a disbelief and a backlash. And that's okay. We've always been ahead of the curve. And if anything, the current platform of the service fabric not just pays homage in spirit to these ideas, but also in the functioning of how the fabric is. It's exactly the sort of things you could have done with service model EX more than a decade ago. And so stay the course and prepare your organization. I would argue that as technical leads, this kind of preparation is more important than helping people with the semicolons here and there. This is the essence of technical leadership. Let me end this with some information on upcoming masterclasses. The next Architects Masterclass in 2018 has a good section on what we discussed today. In fact, this webcast was a highlight from the Architects Masterclass. And we now literally make actors and service fabric part of the Architects Masterclass. The next Architects Masterclass is almost sold out. I think we're down to the last few seats. It's probably going to be sold out by the next few weeks, certainly by the summer's end. And you can also find information about the next Project Design Masterclass, which is a bit more of a runway. And so it's not about to be sold out, but it's definitely filling up. And when it comes to designing the project, well, you also have to think about actors. In fact, in the Project Design Masterclass, we talk a lot about the project as a network and how to design networks of networks. And in fact, that enables us to very uh, accurately model the complexity of the organization and the project with the project and later on the system and the code. So with that, I'm going to end. I bid you all farewell. Thank you so much for attending, and I'll see you on the next time.